listening to Dissecting Dexter. I'm your host, Gareth Watkins, coming to you on a very cold and windy night in Yorkshire, England, as we are being pummeled by Storm Barra. It's horrible outside. No way was I going to risk the mobile studio tonight. You wouldn't hear me. So here we are, exactly halfway through New Blood. We seem to have got here quickly, and I'm worried now that it'll be over all too quickly, but hey, let's not be glass half empty. We've still got five hours of Dexter to enjoy. Now, I'm mindful that we went pretty long last week, and it's great that we have so much to dissect and talk about, but I am conscious of not having these podcasts over long every week, so I won't waffle too much now and get on to introducing my guests just as soon as I say some thank yous to my most recent Patreons. Ryan Gillen, John Richardson and Chris Graham, thanks so much for helping support the podcast. And as always, special thanks to my two premier supporters, Kim and Nick. If you would like to support the podcast for as little as £1 a month, please visit patreon.com slash dissecting Dexter. And speaking of premier supporters, I'm happy to introduce one of them now. She was a contributor during the original series and has returned this season with her thoughts on new blood. From Las Vegas, I'm delighted to welcome Kim. Hey, Kim, how are you doing? I am doing well and sorry to rub it in. It is usually around 70 or so degrees here in Las Vegas around the, and it's really weird because normally it's slightly colder and I mean slightly colder from somebody who lives in Las Vegas where your summer is about 110 degrees so anything below that is freezing to us but it's actually really nice right now so I apologize I wish I could send you some of my weather. <laughs> yeah 70 degrees would be quite welcome about now it's uh yeah it's well we're heading into winter headlong now and um yeah it's not nice out there <laughs> but welcome to the podcast it's it's great to have you on board and and as I say thank you for for being a, a premier supporter and I'm, I'm more than happy to uh, have you with me tonight to talk about this episode um so uh, if you're ready shall we uh, shall we dive in oh yes I'm definitely ready <laughs> excellent so we're talking New Blood episode five, Runaway, original air date, the 5th of December, 2021, written by Veronica West and directed by Marco Siega. So we start appropriately with Dexter looking at Harrison's razor and considering the situation. I, I really like Deb's dialogue here. It's so different from Harry Back in the day, Deb here feels so much more like a part of Dexter's psyche. It really feels like we're digging deep into his mind and seeing his inner turmoil. I want to help him the right way, she says. But of course, it's Dexter himself saying that. And naturally, he does. But he's torn over how to best help him. And, and at this point, he's assuming there's a dark passenger involved. Now, there's a bit of me that that's not convinced there is at this point. I'm not writing Harrison off as a psycho just yet. Are you, Kim? <laughs> Actually, that has me wondering. I keep going back and forth, and I'm not sure if the show is trying to mask that to pull one over on us. Uh, I mean, as far as I know, you know, I guess if there's some people who aren't caught up with season six, I won't talk about uh, reveals uh, that work and don't work, but uh, I don't know if they're just trying to trick us with this is saying Harrison has a dark pas passenger or whatever and we're just guessing until around the end or if he just does have it I don't know what they're trying to do but I just know that Harrison is definitely being the broody teen that is driving me up a wall but to Dexter I think it's important because this is a common theme I've seen in the seasons we've all seen it that Dexter is just excited to have somebody who will accept him for him and his dark passenger and what better person than your own child so I think that's how he's coming at it and your point about Harry and Deb being different I, I like the difference because Harry operated more as his guide for the code when Harry was gone and Deb operates more as his conscious to say hey you got to stop this sort of thing so you got two different styles of somebody once was trying to encourage him and somebody who was discouraging him and I find it really fascinating yeah kind of almost mirroring how they were in real life where harry was was his mentor and deb in in life was was like a like a 
a Jiminy Cricket on his shoulder telling him how to how to do stuff and what not to do and calling him out when he needed calling out and she, she's continuing to do that now uh, and of course Dexter has, has always um, been the unreliable narrator isn't he where we can't take everything he says as gospel can we uh, and for him to say Harrison's got a dark passenger as, as experienced as Dexter is in that kind of thing um, he may be all too eager to um, to embrace that notion and uh, you know not not every child who goes through trauma turns into a psycho and a, and a killer uh, far from it so um, like I say I'm not I'm not ready to um, to stick the label on Harrison's forehead yet sorry you're going to add something um it's just it's interesting because Dexter well I guess this is part of him struggling with his Deb side of his psyche where he was worried that Harrison might have a dark passenger but as soon as he saw that straight razor man that smile he had that one time which is <laughs> fascinating he was just way too excited about that I'm like are you are you I'm not sure where Dexter was going with that at first. And even throughout the rest of this episode, it sounds more like he's trying to get Harrison to almost come out of the closet about being, you know, possibly having a dark passenger. And I don't, it just doesn't jive exactly with what he wants. What exactly does he want from Harrison? And I don't think that's clear to Harrison. I think that's another reason he's clamming up because why is Dexter asking all these questions? Can he just be straightforward at some point? Because clearly he's just making Harrison close up and Harrison just continually throwing lines at him about how he's a liar himself. So why does Harrison have to open up? It's just quite the struggle of where's Dexter trying to go with this and why he just can't kind of give a little bit more of a clue. So maybe Harrison will open up or is he just afraid that if he opens up and kind of gives Harrison the clue that, Okay, yeah, your dad's a killer. That all of a sudden he's in trouble. Is he just is he frightened? Yeah. Well, I mean, Dexter is um, <laughs> he's he's he he just seems he, he just seems so so eager for for Harrison to to have this dark passenger. But wouldn't as a parent you want the the best for your child? And surely the best for your child is not to not to be a killer, not to be a psycho. Um, but as uh, he's He's always been clumsy socially, isn't he? And and particularly when it comes to things that require a bit more, uh, what's the word? Slightly more delicate touch, shall we say? <laughs> um, <laughs> as we saw in in his uh, in his romantic liaisons with with Rita back in the day, and and you know trying to navigate those delicate situations. And here as a father, where it definitely needs um, a delicate touch to um, to handle Harrison appropriately. And um, rather than just calling him out for for dishonesty or um, deceit, uh, of course, as, as we're seeing, it's it's having the effect of Harrison just clamming up, um, and that's not not what he wants at all. He needs to ease back a little bit, I think. But um, I don't think Dexter's got that. <laughs> he's, oh, no. he's not he got that in him. He needs yeah. somebody to do what he normally does. He'll he'll see somebody else interacting with their loved one, like he did with Rita or their child, and he'll just trans he'll just transpose what those people did onto his relationships because he has no idea how to act. So he's like, hey, yeah. this seemed like this worked for this group, so he needs somebody to have a kid, and that would be Angela to say to have an issue with Audrey or something like that that he can try to ease his way into Harrison's life. It just seems like he picks up on what other people are doing and sometimes doesn't apply that correctly because he has no clue how to do it himself. Yeah, yeah. Also in this scene, I loved how Deb says what Harry did was child abuse because this is pretty much what I've been saying for years, that Harry was a terrible father. He didn't intend to be, absolutely not. He, he always had positive intentions and loved Dexter, but I think part of what drove him to his grave was the knowledge that he'd screwed up as a father and could have handled things so differently. I don't think that abuse has to necessarily be something consciously done, but could unintentionally come from well-meant actions. Overall, I thought this opening scene was really well written. Dexter comes out with something very self-reflective and revealing, and it's something that we completely understand knowing him like we do. He says how every day he walks through this world faking it, knowing if anyone found out the truth, they'd throw him down the deepest hole. It's so lonely. F for me, that was pretty heartbreaking and a brilliant performance there from Michael. <laughs> he, he, has made, he has made connections in the past, but 
how many has he been able to be truly free with? Let's, let's see, just off the top of my head, Miguel, Trinity, Brian, Lumen, Hannah. <laughs> how many of those worked out well? <laughs> it's it's been a it's been a tormented existence for him, and arguably originated not just by what happened with his mum, but how Harry brought him up. And he doesn't want the same to happen with Harrison. This this was a highlight of the episode for me, no question. Capped off by that lovely moment when Deb, having just chewed him out as being a monster, just holds him, both their eyes closed. It's a beautiful moment. Yeah, my moment will be later, but we'll get to that. We'll get to that. <laughs> Probably not as profound <laughs> as what you just said. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, moving on, Kurt is absolutely confirmed as the sniper killer this week and all signs point to him being a serial killer acting alone i think uh clancy clancy brown's performance was first rate in this episode first portraying the warmth and kindness giving that girl somewhere to stay and then later the frustrated mania of someone denied their ritual but we'll get to that bit nothing from edward olsen and nothing more about the blood draining we got a glimpse of in episode three, was it? So it remains to be seen what he's he's playing at there. I'm going to be a little disappointed if we don't see Olsen again, because if that was just a misdirect to go, hey, guys, we'll just take an episode to mislead you that who is it out of these two older guys? And then yeah. all of a sudden, boom, they just give us Kurt this immediately. And then all of a sudden, I haven't seen anything about it. He just gave his uh, planes or whatever, his, his helicopter, and was just like, bye, done with it. And yeah. now we don't see him. Yeah, I, I think he'll be back. But we'll see in, in what capacity. So uh, Angela and Molly go on a road trip to New York, still wanting to confirm if Matt Coldwell really is there. From Angela's point of view, she wants the confirmation before closing the missing person case. But also there's the crime of killing the deer to answer for, for Molly, who actually I found less irritating this week. But she wants to keep an eye, uh, keep an eye on things in case she can make a podcast out of it. I think I've, I was maybe a little bit harsh on her, actually. <laughs> Jamie Chung was on the wrap up podcast last week and incidentally uh, swore as much as uh, Deb does. <laughs> I don't know if you listened to it. <laughs> but, I did. Yeah. But she described Molly as confident and someone, um, I, and I'm paraphrasing a bit, but she said something along the lines of Molly being someone who knows what she wants and will uh, persevere until she gets it, doing whatever she needs to. And there's nothing wrong with that as long as no one gets hurt. So where I saw someone being cocky and arrogant before, perhaps I should have just interpreted it as confident, although this does show how the two can get blurred when someone's a bit overconfident. <laughs> do, you, do you like Molly? Um, I think I said it in my feedback. You know, I definitely love Molly just for the fact of it's Jamie Chung and I was a huge fan and had a huge crush on um, Mulan in Once Upon a Time. So, you know, of course, I'm a huge fan of that. But though she did, she did and kind of still does annoy me uh, because I tend to not enjoy people with that kind of a personality type. But at the same time, I understand because if you're going to be in any sort of investigative journaling or anything like that, um, journalism, then you're going to have to have a certain demeanor about you to get information from people. You got to be confident. Sometimes you just almost have to be a bully because usually people give it. If you ask too many times, it's like, okay, I'm going to give you something. So she's doing true crime. And uh, if she's now doing cases where it's not just talking about the Bay Harbor butcher or whatever, or the baby killer, you know, cases that have already been either solved or cold for a while. She's literally out there trying to investigate something and put together a podcast now and probably investigate on her own. So she has to have a certain personality to help her to get in the good graces of people. It got her in uh, Logan's pants and consequently <laughs> some information, got her close to Angela. So there's something about that personality that's perfect for somebody who's doing a true crime podcast. And even that, the way she speaks in that podcast, I would never subscribe to that. That would drive me off the wall how she has to speak in that. But there are some podcasts Podcasts out there, and I'm not going to name them, that the host sounds like that. And I just immediately hit unsubscribe. I was just done with that. But people do talk like that. Yeah. Yeah. I, th I think uh, as you were talking there, a phrase that came to mind is dogged determination. And I, I think that's what she's got. Uh, and she does what she needs to do to get get the story. She, uh, yeah, I guess that, that's a, a, a quality of a, a good journalist. Um, 
Yeah, so I like like you said, I I don't think in real life I I think I would I would I wouldn't be comfortable uh, in her company. <laughs> I think yeah. she would I think she would rub me up the wrong way and um yeah, put me off, but um and that may be why I had quite a strong reaction to her in the first place. So, uh yeah, so we we know that um uh, sorry, we just, yeah, just jumping to to Harrison now. Um, he, he comes home from school, uh, excited by what happened with the praise he got for tackling Ethan. It seems like he got a bit of a boost from that, not just socially but personally. And he did give a good speech. However, he stops in his tracks when he sees Dexter with the razor. There's obviously a, a betrayal of trust here that Dexter's mm -hmm. gone through his things. They've not been with each other very long, so that trust is still in the early stages of, of being established. And, and now it feels shattered, quite honestly. And uh, I can't blame Harrison, really. He claims that he carries the uh, the blade for protection, that he slept on the streets for a time. So that's something we didn't know about him. And it goes a little way to perhaps filling in some gaps. You can understand him needing to carry something if he's been sleeping rough, but a straight edge razor, it seems an odd yeah. choice, especially given how his mum died. So I don't think I fully believe him here. How about you? Yeah, I, I was wondering about that, about that specific weapon. Um, and when when did he necessarily get it? Because did he know about exactly how his mom was murdered before he even got into the town because that would make a little more sense that he would pick that and as something more of a you know this is a tool that was used to kill my mother and now I have it as a means of control there's just the psychology behind that is very interesting to try to figure that out but I don't know I it just seems like a very random thing to have. I can understand a pocket knife, switchblade thing. I was like, yeah. that is a really interesting thing to have. I kind of want it, but then I feel like people would look at me weird. Yeah. I mean, it, like you say, if, if he knew about how Rita died before, then maybe it was a symbolic choice on his part in some weird way. Uh, but yeah, otherwise, it just seems like a strange choice of, of weapon, doesn't it? And a bit too on the nose. I don't know. Maybe we'll maybe we'll find out later. We do know um, that if Harrison did indeed do something to Ethan on purpose, then Dexter is a good person to talk to and would understand. But Harrison doesn't know that. <laughs> He's a teenage kid who's been through who knows what in the last eight years or so. And now he feels betrayed by his dad. Simple as that. Yes, he's he's being defensive for self-protection. But we trust Dexter's reading of the blood last week. It's it's quite a unique situation that has more serious implications than, say, a parent finding cigarettes or porn stashed in their kid's bedroom. <laughs> uh, sorry, yeah, go on. A little more tolerable, a little more tolerable if it was just porn or something. Yes, yeah, it, yeah, it had preferred that, wouldn't he? Or maybe he wouldn't. I don't know. <laughs> So, I think he'd uh, just be too awkward. The rest of us would <clears throat> probably know how to deal with that. But Dexter, on the other hand, I, I don't know. He probably mm. would just he'd just want to talk about violence. It's probably easier. Yeah, I think he'd be more comfortable with that. <laughs> uh, so when when Harrison storms out, uh, Dexter goes for a drink at the tavern and gets the number for a therapist who might be able to help Harrison. Kurt comes in and he's acting very odd. He's all giddy with excitement. Now, knowing what we do about him and that he's just got his next victim stashed at the cabin, we can see it's like a like a, a euphoria in anticipation of the kill. He plays the same runaway song that he did before. It's like it's like listeners have reminded us in feedback how in season four Trinity used to play the same song. Kurt does this little dance, ropes in Tess from behind the bar and it's. It's clear this is something he does from time to time. This all seems to be part of his ritual. I half expected Dexter to recognise this and get a little uh, spidey sense tingle like he has in the past. But instead, he just looks at him with mild, was it amusement? <laughs> Trying to read his expression. What, what did you think? I think, yeah, I don't think he was paying attention, though, uh, probably near when we finally get through the episode there is a connection that i think is going to eventually be made 
but certain things are going to have to happen before it starts to click in Dexter's head because right now he's too concerned about number one making sure that Matt's body um, now that it's been I guess cremated <laughs> Yeah. that part's done so he's got at least that out of the way though you know technically i don't think he should be thinking he's in the clear on that one and he's also concerned is a son a killer or not and yeah. so he had a lot of other stuff on his mind but i think he already has some of the keys like seeing uh chloe talking to kurt not too long ago in the restaurant um that is eventually going to lead him to something and the fact that he saw him doing it sounds like kurt was doing his uh pre-ritual like cycle starting uh play this song kind of thing it's going to start to add up but there's going to be something that's going to happen later that i think is going to help him add up that's if my theory becomes uh true in the upcoming episodes yeah yeah so uh unfortunately harrison's upset and angry at his dad and this feeds into what happens at the party and creates the problems dexter has to deal with for the rest of the episode Harrison has a right old cocktail of drugs and alcohol, and I was getting worried he'd end up saying something he shouldn't. It was really weird how that girl wanted him to carve an H into her foot. <laughs> how messed up was that? <laughs> that was <laughs> weird. Just bizarre. <laughs> I don't, carve an don't, H into I have my a question foot. on that. Yeah. Do you think that actually happened, or was Harrison really, really stinking high? Uh yes and yes <laughs> <laughs> having having heard the wrap-up podcast this week they they bring this moment up and um it sounds like a case of the girl being high as well and as soon as that knife started to cut it was a case of ow <laughs> i don't think she'd expected it to hurt quite so much what seemed like a good idea at the time suddenly wasn't <laughs> yeah and i think it was also used as a tool to maybe also tip us in the direction that there might be a dark passenger because who in the world does that i mean i guess if we're both super high then you know might do anything but the mm. fact that he was just so nonchalant he's like all right he was like, give me it give me that knife and swoop, slice her yeah. up and then and that's it and he had no qualms but he was also pretty drunk and high so i mean i guess that was just to give us another clue that harrison just don't care he's gonna do what he's gonna do yeah i mean I, i'm not good with blood in real life so i i it's not certainly not something i would do however However much I'd had to drink. <laughs> I I did think that the um, throughout this whole sequence, the uh, the production, the, the direction and the sound design was really good. Um, you know how how um, the camera stayed with him. He had a uh, there was a behind the scenes photo and he had, uh, on Twitter and he had a the actor had a, a camera rig around him sort of um, just fixed on his face as he was um, to give you that sort of dizzy sensation and, and the music went all foggy didn't it like he was oh. kind of there but not <laughs> I, I wasn't surprised when he collapsed but not before saying too much to Audrey that his dad's name isn't Jim Lindsay and it's <laughs> oh god here we go <laughs> did you get that sinking feeling yeah I just I, I knew this was going to be bad and I was like you know, I was uncomfortable the entire party I was thinking oh no what is this kid gonna say <laughs> and he just keeps drinking and taking all these random pills that he's asking no questions about and apparently Audrey's over here just completely sober and I just knew something was gonna happen and I'm surprised more didn't come out but you know clearly he had other things going on but yeah I already knew I was like uh oh things are gonna fall apart now yeah yeah that was enough wasn't it and then when he came around it's officer Logan there who has a busy episode this week, doesn't he? I, I honestly thought it'd be a paramedic there to start with, but uh, I guess they have to travel from further away and Logan got there first. He's not happy with the kids who had the drugs though. And at the hospital, Dexter looks really rattled, angry even. He gets quite stroppy and almost aggressive with Logan, who to his credit, lets him say his piece and just walks away. But he does tell him the name of the suspected drug dealer. Now. Would an officer really reveal that to a parent, even in a small town like this? Maybe it's a nitpick, but it serves the storyline for Dexter to then pursue his revenge, which takes up most of the rest of the episode. He encourages Harrison to go and see that therapist, but um, I don't think Harrison ever had any intention of going. <laughs> nope. So let's switch back to Kurt. We see how obsessed he is with his ritual 
the girl, uh, Chloe, wasn't it, uh, thinks that he wants something sexual. Um, although um, on the wrap up podcast, they, they suggest that she was fully clued into what she was doing when she took her top off and, and she was just trying to set a trap for him. Um, and of course, Kurt gets frustrated that she's essentially spoiling the ritual. Um, she has a shard of mirror, doesn't she, under the pillow? And we we don't see how she got it, but perhaps she broke the mirror in the bathroom. I don't know. But Kurt gets all in a rage. <laughs> didn't Trinity do that when his ritual was spoiled before? Yeah, I think he get, did, didn't he? You got yeah, he got really, really flustered on that one. And for one, I got very flustered, too, when she took her top off because A plus. That's all I'm going to say about that one. <laughs> so, so Kurt just seems to want to see her scared. He's not interested in in seeing her undressed or anything like that. That's not how he gets his jollies. He just wants to see the fright and the panic and seems to feed off that. And he marches up to the room and she, to her credit, she shows some pluck and courage by lunging at him with the glass. It's just a shame for her that she barely grazes him. And then it gets to the point where she knows she's screwed whatever she does and runs at him, which, which forces his hand. And uh, he's seriously pissed off and frustrated, his whole ritual ruined. And when she's dead, his reaction is almost childlike. But I did love the guts that she showed, didn't you? Yeah, I she j exposed the formula that it would take to have somebody run for freedom. They have to be very bold, though, of course, it backfired around the end. Obviously, if you run towards somebody with a gun, you take chances. But she was taking chances. She's going to she realized she was probably going to be shot no matter what she did. So might as well go for something bold and maybe she would have tackled him and or something, but I think she just gave us the outline of how he can be stopped, is that all you have to do is mess up his ritual and he's gonna get so flustered, but she's of course gotta figure out how to do that before a man gets hold of a gun, apparently. <laughs> yeah, and of course, as like anyone, uh, when we get flustered, we're more liable to make a mistake. So uh, maybe that will at some point be his undoing, who knows? And also so, there's, Something interesting I wanted to bring, I don't know if it's been brought up yet, is that the idea that they're using of him basically shooting these girls as they're running away, it seems like they, I don't know if they talk about this in the wrap-up podcast, but it's very much uh, like Robert Hansen. Have you heard of him as a serial killer? Robert Hansen? Um, no, it doesn't ring a bell. He, uh, basically, he would kidnap these women and then he would take them in a helicopter drop them off in the middle of the wilderness and he would hunt them with nothing but a gun and a knife um so it's very reminiscent of that to me where he, he just the hunt is the fun part you get them nice and scared and then you give them some freedom like they're going to get away and then you hunt them but apparently they're not going to do a full hunt they did, she just runs and then he just shoots her in the back <laughs> so yeah yeah uh yeah i i don't think they mentioned that on the wrap up podcast they did allude to the song having uh, a meaning as you might reasonably deduce from what we've seen already clearly that song is um, is important to him um and but it sounds like there's uh, there's more to come about why that song later on so we we can you know that set some 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 juices going and and we can theorize about that but uh, that's yeah that's something to come we uh, we join Angela and Molly uh, in New York. They go to uh, the hotel where uh, Matt Caldwell has apparently been staying. And to cut the story short, it looks like someone else is using his credit card. There's a guy there looking all shifty and suspicious on the CCTV. Now, I don't know if Kurt paid him to do that. I don't know. Um, I can't, I'm trying to remember whether what Dexter did with Matt's wallet. Did he? chuck that near the road i can't remember do you yeah i can't remember i can't remember what they what he did with it but at the same time i could see him paying somebody to do it and i don't know how easy it would be to get a hold of his credit cards or anything like that i mean i'm not quite sure but i feel like kurt is probably paying this person and didn't and which is strange did he not think that angela was going to follow up She's, he just thought his random visit to the police station was going to stop her and just say, OK, he's alive. No, a real cop is going to go. That's cool and all that you talk to him. But until I lay eyes on him, nope, 
dude's still gone, so I need to find this out because also, you know, he killed an animal on sacred land, so I'm not just going to let that go. So I don't think Kurt was uh, planning that very well. <laughs> yeah, I think he, he underestimated Angela, didn't he? And so uh, so she knows it's not Matt, which seems to throw some confusion over Kurt saying that he's spoken to him. However, what's more important for us fans, of course, is the appearance of our favourite pork pie hat guy, <laughs> Angel Batista, <laughs> or, or we should say Captain Batista. Now, ha- how great was it to see him again? Did it you get a little happy. thrill? <laughs> I was so excited to see him in his hat. He's adorable. I mean, I always liked Batista. Um, he just got the short end of the stick a lot with some storylines sometimes. And it was good to see him in at Captain, too, because he got passed over for that. <laughs> so mm-hmm. it, it's nice to see him in that position. And he's truly, uh, other than Vince, probably one of the ones I'd want to see. Uh, back on the show probably not permanently at this point because there's just too much going on to introduce any more even characters we know but he's he's just been one of my favorites yeah he doesn't seem to have aged a day and he looked very dapper in his suit Angela has a chat with him after his talk at the conference and I have to admit I was a bit disappointed that he so readily tried to hit on her you'd have (laughs) you'd have hoped he'd found love and happiness in the last eight years And although his career has gone well, it looks like maybe his personal life hasn't so much. So I was just a bit disappointed that he was so quick to flirt. He didn't chase every girl in the original series. (laughs) So I was I was. uh, Yeah, I I didn't think it was necessary for him to do it now. However, yeah, yeah, he could have just helped. He could have had a a constructive conversation and, and been helpful. However, it was really good to see him again. No question. It was nice. Pardon? I said he just likes dating cops, apparently. I mean, you know, who was it? Yeah. Diana? And then, of course, LaGuerta. He just, as yeah. soon as he heard cop, woman, hey, that's, that's my type. Yeah. Woman, cop. Yeah, maybe he likes a girl in uniform. I, I don't know. <laughs> uh, but it was nice to hear him refer to Deb. But were you surprised that he couldn't remember Harrison's name at first? A case like that, and, and knowing those involved like he did, you'd think they'd be imprinted on his brain. That that exchange was weird. And I know sometimes you'll have a conversation with a stranger and they'll talk about some people you don't even know. And they have this cute little kid named Bobby or whatever, but it just seemed very weird. So it's just kind of a, a strange thing to me. Was it a convenient drop of something? And of course he would know Harrison. It's not like, I mean, and also his sister babysat the kid. I mean, I, it's been years. Yes. So yeah, I can understand. But at the yeah. same time, you know, but it just seemed like they used that as a way to drop Harrison's name for Angela and just seemed a little weird. Yeah, yeah, it, it, it may have felt a little shoehorned in for um, for Angela's benefit. Um, and I wonder whether him briefly forgetting was, was just for a bit of dramatic tension where we think, oh, he's not going to say it. Oh, he did. <laughs> yeah, probably. <laughs> Mind you, I'm, I'm the first to admit a failing memory as I get older, so... <laughs> <laughs> and batista has got a, a good few years on me. <laughs> but, the, <laughs> but the mention of Harrison seems to register with Angela. Perhaps it's that feeling in her gut that Batista was just talking about. Now, she has no reason to suspect that it's the same Harrison, but her face suggests that her brain's doing some cartwheels. <laughs> How many kids do you just call Harrison? Like, Usually their name is Harry or something like that. You have a nickname. And of course, I'm, I'm sure there's a kid named Harrison out there and everybody calls him Harrison. But that just seemed really convenient. My my boyfriend's kid who just came in town named Harrison. You're talking about somebody named Harrison, not Harry. Harrison. Yeah. Yeah. So um, Dexter sets off to the next town. Moose Creek, was it? He goes to the bar to try and find this guy, Miles, who Logan believes supplied the drugs for the kids at the party. However, First, he does a bit of shopping, grabbing some bags and some tranquilizer from the vet, which um, I don't know. Does she do a stock take? Would she know that he hadn't taken? Actually, would he? Have, I wonder if he actually, I couldn't see the bottle, what said on the bottle, whether he did take ketamine or whether he grabbed some tranquilizer like like the old days. Um, what was it? M99, wasn't it, that he used to yeah. use? Of course, he's got which, murder in mind. Yeah. Sorry, go on. That- that, that OK, I guess once there's a couple of times, I guess you have to chalk things up to a small town because I was thinking, I guess if you trust the guy, I mean, we know who he is. So, of course, we're thinking that's crazy. Why would you just give this guy, you know, this ketamine and syringes and and everything and not even pay attention because uh, clearly she was busy. But at the same time, the small town, they know she knows him. Maybe he has a reason. He has a, he has a farm. 
he has animals. So it's not weird to her, but it just seems like a, a nice way to say, hey, we're not really going to go into technically how he gets these things done now that he no longer is a cop that can just get to these things easily. It's a small town. They trust people. Just go with it. <laughs> Yeah, I think I think you're right. We have to remember from or, or, or look at it from from the vet's point of view, which is as you as you just described. So, uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Yeah. So Dexter is is planning murder, of course, <laughs> letting letting his anger uh, rule, um, uh, rule rule the day. Uh, uh, his anger over what happened to Harrison and, and it's clouding his judgment, uh, forgetting the rule of sticking to the code. When it comes to targets, we hear him admit later that the code has nothing to do with this. He really is just angry about Harrison and wants revenge. Simple as that. He says having a kid makes you vulnerable. I heard a nice line once that becoming a parent and having a child is like wearing your heart on the outside of your body. Uh, I always like that one. And it's, it's very true. Dexter really is vulnerable here. Harrison is his weak spot and it's perfectly normal for a parent to want to defend their child. It's just most of us wouldn't resort to murder. <laughs> anyway, uh, Dexter has to think on his feet a couple of times. Firstly, when he's just injecting Miles outside the bar and the police show up, he was very quick to start punching him instead. I imagine Miles waking up later thinking, I didn't think he hit me that hard. Because <laughs> he'd, take, <laughs> he'd taken the syringe, didn't he? <laughs> Oh, and, then yeah. <laughs> again, and then again later at the kill table. But didn't you think it pretty careless for Logan to conduct the interview in clear earshot of Dexter? I mean, the, the door was open. Oh. He didn't notice oh. Dexter sitting right outside. It was pretty bad. <laughs> yeah, that's thinking. I was like, does this one of those happen chalk it up to a small town? Because you, you would think that if you're interrogating anybody, you wouldn't leave a door open. Even if your other cops are there, you know, mm. you'd want to make sure that you're the person that you're interrogating doesn't you know, Phil is like, hey, you're going to close that. You know, you don't want them distracted by anything else. You want to close that door and get answers out of them. And I guess Logan was, he seemed very furious throughout this. And I guess I would be too, if, you know, as a cop and found out a whole party of young people was just getting crazy messed up on drugs and one of them almost died. And this being the police chief's uh, boyfriend's son, it, you know, yeah. there's a lot going on there. But at the same time, I, I just don't even know what to say. That was just another one of those this is how Dexter finds out. We're not even going to, we're going to yada yada over if that's nonsense yeah. or not. We just need Dexter to find these things out. And he does this a couple times in the episode, just conveniently as we able to find this, you know, it's just like how my Miami Metro apparently was not the most competent all the time when it came to some of these things. Now this little small town uh, group of cops, not always making the best choices. And I'm just, just wondering, okay, but it's usually plot convenience and I guess I'm here for it. Yeah. Yeah. Plot wise. Uh, this needed to happen for Dexter to get his lead on the guy who makes the drugs. But it it was a bit convenient for it to happen like this. I did like the intensity from Logan, though, uh, as, as you alluded. He he showed a nice bit of fire, didn't he? However, um, com convenient plotting happened again, didn't it? With Logan writing the drug makers uh, address on a, a, a notepad, leaving it in full view on Esther's desk. <laughs> Obviously, that was so great. <laughs> yeah, obviously he doesn't know who Dexter really is, but still, he'd already shown a tendency for violence over this, so he should have been a bit more careful. Yeah, you might as well have written that in block letters uh, and just like on a on a chalkboard. <laughs> I mean, that was pretty darn yeah. clear. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Deb tries to talk Dexter out of the kill. It's true, he could just walk away and focus on Harrison. Killing this guy just creates more complications and potential for getting caught, which, of course, is the first rule of the code. Don't get caught in the house, though. <laughs> what did you think of the wallpaper? I I just commented on it to my wife when Dexter said that funny line about deserving to die just for the wallpaper. <laughs> it was awful. <laughs> yes, <laughs> it was terrible. Well, I mean, yeah. I was drinking and still while watching this episode, and still I was just like, what is that? I cannot be that drunk right now. That is the yeah. ugliest wallpaper I've ever seen. <laughs> and and we get a kill table and then we don't. <laughs> I, I didn't mind, though. <laughs> he shouldn't be killing this guy anyway. If, if he wants to be a good dad to his son, killing people only puts him and them in jeopardy. If, oh, yeah. if he ever wants to move forward, he should just let the police deal with it. And they were. Logan was outside staking out the place. A little bit of me wanted him to take out the trash, 
but the bigger more sensible bit wanted him to be wanted him to be sensible and think straight mm. and and then dexter was the one who was who was pissed off and but behaved a bit more maturely than kurt uh, i say pissed off at having his ritual um uh, cut short but yeah he did oh, take yeah. it better and 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 thought more clearly faking an overdose so we still killed the guy just not through his ritual do you think he deserved to i mean did he meet the code and i i guess tangentially he definitely could because i mean if you're an adult maybe if you're not you if you're a teen at a party you wouldn't know fentanyl can really kill somebody just one dose one incorrect dose can kill somebody so an adult selling drugs probably will know that but did did this man actually fit the code because he de he technically almost killed harrison but n not intentionally it's not like he just walked up to harrison's like hey take this take this pill so you can die he's just yeah. selling drugs to excited people yeah would it be like killing them by proxy i'm, I'm not sure how quite how he'd i mean it's a technicality isn't it <laughs> sort of killing yeah. them indirectly um but they on the on the wrap-up podcast again they they described it as um an emotional kill rather than um from his 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 need it was it was emotional driven by what happened to his son which i guess and, as, a, as a parent i can kind of empathize with but i'm um, empathize with but as i said earlier most parents wouldn't resort to murder <laughs> that, oh that is very true and there's also um the fact that uh you know people want dexter to continue to live on because he gets rid of the bad guys but i feel like there's always that danger of him making that emotional kill that will making make him kill somebody that's innocent or somebody that i mean he killed hannah's dad and i don't remember hannah's dad he was a complete jerk but i don't remember him killing anybody so where i love dexter and would love to see him taking out the trash forever it's just not realistic that he should just continue on and just live until you know he turns like 90 and just passes away naturally because there is that propensity that ability to skip over the code and just kill somebody because he just really wants them out of the way and he's already done it unless i'm missing a point that i forgot when i did my rewatch but he's already killed somebody that didn't actually kill anybody yeah yeah he has so uh so we're getting towards the end of the episode now and uh we we come back with uh, come back to kurt who concludes his involvement in the episode finding harrison out on the road who's packed his bags to get out of town presumably having given up on connecting with his dad or was he just scared of people discovering what really happened with ethan what, what do you think do you think I he's think given up a, i think it's a mixture of that where you know he found his dad and his dad seems to be a disappointment because all his dad is doing is just questioning him and won't trust him and and that's kind of hard to start a relationship with your parent if your parents always suspiciously questioning you so he's disappointed in that and then uh even though he's got the whole hero tag you know he's almost got almost died so there's a lot that has happened in this town that's just not good so i don't blame him for wanting to go because he doesn't have the connection with his dad what's he going to stay for there's nothing really there for him yeah nothing really good has come from him being here <laughs> <laughs> obviously he's, he's he has met up with his dad again but that's not going very well and and of course harrison is still a teenager um there's maybe some immaturity still there and and as we know we've all been teenagers haven't we need jerk reactions are, are a feature <laughs> you know not not thinking things through reacting first and, and asking questions later um and maybe he's he's guilty of that here uh but um kurt takes him for dinner now we've we've i've had some feedback this week um and i've had a a, a a read through a lot of it already and and some people are considering whether kurt was mad about his kill being spoiled and he's looking for another quick fix and whether harrison might be a target i don't think so it, it breaks his victim pattern and serial killers do like their routines but some suggest that Kurt might already know that Dexter had something to do with Matt's disappearance and may want to take Harrison in revenge. Do you have any thoughts on that? I think that second option is much closer because, yeah, it breaks his pattern, even though I could try using the excuse of now that he's been thrown off his pattern, maybe he's trying something else because he just really needs to get that kill in. But I really think that it has to do with um, he's suspicious of Dexter and 
even though he, because that drone has to come back into play. It better, <laughs> because he did give Harrison a drone. But now he's going to have that little spy that may be able to help him figure out if Dexter knows more, or he can actually just use him to be his eyes and ears around the town to figure out what people are thinking about Matt. Because if he keeps him around and he actually treats him well, unlike his dad, he's going to ingratiate him toward him because he won't be running to his dad anymore if Kurt is giving him everything he needs, that comfort he needs, and acts like a father. Yeah, yeah. Kurt gives Harrison some sort of fatherly advice <laughs> uh, during this during this meal, uh, and he says something about that when you see red, uh, do something nice for the person who's pissing you off. Uh, so you kind of turn that negative into a positive. Now, it's a nice idea, but we know Kurt was angry about his kill, seeing Red. So is he helping Harrison as an act of kindness for the person he's mad with, Dexter? This this could be a hint that Kurt really does know Dexter was involved with Matt. It, he, he also says how you can never outrun rage, which draws a look from Harrison. Whether he's wondering if Kurt is talking about himself, whether he's thinking about his own rage, we don't know. But it was an interesting look that Harrison gave him. Did you catch that? Yeah, I caught that. We, it, it's, and I don't know if it was Dark Passenger or recognizing Dark Passenger. I know when I was reading the books, there was a lot of that where fellow killers could sense a dark passenger in each other for some reason. I guess it was more of a spiritual thing in the books, but it just seemed maybe Harrison either that was, oh, I've found somebody else who has dark tendencies or he's just thinking, well, what's wrong with this guy? Yeah. So uh, the upshot from, from this is that Harrison goes back to Dexter's uh, job offer in hand from Kurt. Apparently he's changed his mind about leaving town. Perhaps he's thinking that now that leaving town won't fix things and running away from that rage Kurt mentioned. I think he's doing the right thing coming back. <laughs> where, where else would he go anyway? Dexter's still his only living relative and can at least provide a roof over his head. He's obviously got a lot on his mind, perhaps like most boys his age. It's been so long I can't remember <laughs> being a teenager. <laughs> the atmosphere is a little off though at uh, Shea Dexter. Things are still frosty like that weird, tense, quiet you get after an argument. It, it leaves me hopeful, though, that they can reconcile and move forward. Do you think Harrison has come back hoping to make up with his dad or do you get a different vibe? I think he, he's going to have now that he's got a, a second chance and he's got another purpose and a possible job, he might say, well, maybe I'll give him a chance. You know, maybe I'll pay it forward, as Kurt is saying, and, you know, but at the same time, I feel a child that has had to lose both parents and found out one of them is is still alive is probably going to continue trying if they keep getting opportunities because it's they desperately just want that connection and that's their living family member. So I feel now that he has an opportunity, he's going to try again, or at least, you know, I don't know necessarily if he was trying. He's not making it easy to try, and neither is Dexter, but they're both very closed off. So it's very, it's like watching two people that really like each other that won't admit that they like each other try to, you know, establish some sort of relationship. It's just real awkward. Yeah, it is. But I'm I'm really rooting for them, you know, as, as, as a parent and just as a fan of Dexter, I, I want him to connect with his son. I, I, I don't know that I want Harrison to end up having his own dark passenger, but I want Dexter to be happy ultimately, don't don't we all? Don't we all want a happy ending for yes. him? <laughs> of course. Yeah. So we come to the end of the episode with Angela returning home to Audrey and hearing about what happened at the party. Audrey brings up what Harrison said about his dad not really being called Jim. Angela looks very puzzled and we then see her in the police office she only seems to type a few words and then looks very concerned and prints out what we see is dexter morgan's obituary i wasn't expecting that <laughs> if if she googled deborah morgan and harrison following her conversation with batista she might have then found dexter's picture but she seemed to go straight to dexter's obituary Maybe they abbreviated her search for viewer comfort so the sequence wasn't too long. But the moment seemed too brief to be realistic to me. She she wouldn't know the name Dexter Morgan 
to go directly to it with literally a few key presses. Maybe it's just another nitpick, <laughs> but whatever. This is a game changer. <laughs> she has the photo and the name and it's not Jim Lindsay. So who is this man she's been sleeping with? <laughs> what was your reaction to this? I, yeah, I was at the, it, it seemed, I was like, what did she type? I even had to rewind it and just sit there and go, she didn't type that long. I mean, they could have alleviated that by, you know, making it a quick cut scene where she's just talks to Audrey and she drops that. And then, I mean, I know it was around the end of the episode, they'd probably have to push it up a little bit, but just have her go to her computer and sit down and then start typing and then cut to another scene and come back. And then she's suddenly she's printing it out. And that would have taken, that would have probably taken me less out of the scene. But then the obituary comes out and I was just thinking now, now somebody knows, but I don't think she's the only one that knows. And, yeah. and uh, I don't know if this is the moment for me to speculate on who else knows because if there's more to it but I really think there is somebody else who knows what's going on in this in this town that is going to play a major part or at least I'm hoping so because if you it'll be brilliant writing to do so but but that person of course would be Molly I yes. really do think she knows that who Dexter is because there's no way she does a whole podcast and looks up Rita Morgan and hears about the son who's probably all jacked up and everything and then suddenly she's in this small town and even though the girls missing is kind of a, a nice thing to investigate for a podcast I really think she somehow was tracking him down and she's now found him and that she's going to play a much bigger part and probably end up being murdered yeah maybe by Harrison to protect his dad <laughs> yeah actually that would make sense yeah. yeah um at this point in the episode my wife suggested that um this doesn't have to be the end of things for him he could come clean to angela to a degree and say uh, uh well with with what happened to his wife and then his sister that he fell apart uh, he could lie and say he had a breakdown or something. He couldn't bear to stay in Miami and wanted a clean break, so he took off. Angela might understand and sympathise. She seems like a good person, although there'd be questions as to how he could leave his son and who did he leave him with, bringing on more questions that could lead to Angela finding out about Hannah. Oh, <laughs> this isn't going to end well. Um, whether Angela will challenge Dexter immediately, I don't know, or bide her time and see how this plays out. He may have to think on his feet as he won't have a story prepared. He, he won't be prepared for having his cover blown. He's a good liar, but Angela, as we've seen, isn't a fool. And, and yeah. Molly, how excited will she be to find out who Jim really is? <laughs> as, as you say, as you suggest, she may already know all those cases Dex has been involved with. He'd be a goldmine for a podcast. <laughs> or maybe because if if Angela realises how much Dexter and Harrison have been through, and God knows they've been through some terrible stuff, Angela might understand and agree to keep their secret. Yeah, it could be that. It, I guess it all depends on how quickly Dexter thinks on his feet, because, I mean, she sort of let it pass about Harrison when he first arrived, but she kept alluding to it. One of those, you know, the usual um, when you have a partner or girlfriend in there just going to kind of continue to guilt you about something you didn't tell them about. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, that's already the first strike, and I don't think she's going to easily let it go, um, but he has to think quickly on his feet, and I think the only way he can go is the one you said, because, I mean, you'd want to start over if there was nothing but death around you, your wife was murdered, your sister dies, and it's just too much, so I can see why he would run away, and if he can lean into that and make that believable, but again, Dexter is not always the quickest on his feet when he has to explain something to somebody that, you know, doesn't actively you know, involved that he's getting ready to kill somebody. He seems to be able to make up whatever then. But if it comes to regular life situations, he just gets very flustered. Yeah. And he's he's not going to see this coming. This will come out of left field. So I, so I don't know whether Angela is going to go straight to him. Um, and, and, and in that conversation with with Batista, there was a lot of emphasis on trusting your gut feeling, trusting your gut and Clearly, her, her gut is telling her something here um, and, and mustn't forget, as, as you say, she's she just had that uh, issue of, of Dexter's, sorry, Jim's 
uh, son just turning up out of the blue that she never knew he had that he'd never mentioned you know all these all these little pieces add up uh she's going to have some questions so i think i think next week's episode is going to be um it's going to be good there's going to be uh going to be some fireworks <laughs> oh yeah that's putting yeah. it mildly. I'm just glad that they actually outed him this early. I was expecting them to drag that out and suddenly episode eight, whoop, there here comes the reveal. But nope, they they went for it. Yeah, yeah. That's why I described it as a game changer. And it, and this is only episode five. We're we're halfway through the season. It's doing this at this point, you think, well, where, where else can the show go? It it makes me wonder whether she's going to keep his secret and he might um play on her sympathies. And and a lot of what he can tell her can be true, can't it? You know, he's he's been through some stuff. His wife did die. Um, his mother was murdered. He he could tell her quite a lot without stopping short of telling her that he kills people. <laughs> <laughs> yes, true, very true. Yeah, yeah. So uh, that's that's where the episode concludes. And um, I don't know if you heard that it was uh, that the music at the end it, it wasn't the blood theme apparently it was and i didn't recognize his voice but it was michael c hall's band uh it was one of their songs playing over the credits what are they oh, called yes. princess at the butterfly museum or something yeah something like that uh i forget and he's got a beautiful voice it's not exactly my style but he's very talented very talented multi-talented chap <laughs> And on, and on that note, that that brings us to the end of the uh, to the of, of the episode. So, um, is there anything else you want to? Do you have anything else you wanted to bring up about the episode? Uh, no, other than I am just I'm excited to see where this goes, um, and just I'm actually really really liking this season. I don't even know why I'm saying like that. Like I'm shocked. Uh, it seems like. Uh, after the disappointment of season eight that they had nowhere to go but up after that and i think they're really there even though i you know there are some gripes with things i think they're doing a very good job of taking uh, the feel of dexter and updating it and giving us a new feel but the same feel all at the same time it's not miami but at the same time we still have our lovable dexter doing his whatever he's going to do and thankfully finding kills and being a little more versatile i mean that making a drug dealer OD. That was a nice way to uh, cover that up and still get his kill in. So, I mean, I'm enjoying how this is going. Yeah, yeah, me too. This was, uh, I, I enjoyed this episode despite having uh, a couple of nitpicks. Um, I, th I think this was this was a good episode. Uh, it moved along briskly. I think, well, I said last week that episode four was my favourite so far this season. And, and I think maybe it still edges it. Um, if only for the uh, the scene where they were looking at the the, the blood in the school, because that was awesome. I think that'll definitely be in my my top five moments of the season when when uh, yeah. when things come to an end. Um, and looking on IMDb today, I noticed that this episode has certainly when I looked this afternoon, it had the highest rating of all five episodes. So it seems like a lot of people are, are picking this as their favourite so far it is my favorite i think so far and uh and then my favorite point the my favorite moment is chloe's chest there you go that put that <laughs> episode right <laughs> over the top <laughs> something tells me you won't be the only one to say that <laughs> although you might be the only one to say it out loud but <laughs> <laughs> <True. laughs> and on that note um <laughs> thank you very much for joining me kim it's been great to uh, to chat to you and um dissect this episode it was some good stuff to uh to dig into and um you had some some good thoughts and uh it was uh yeah absolute pleasure to to talk to you so thanks ever so much for coming on with me today thank you for having me on listener feedback okay let's get into some feedback shall we firstly on facebook randall wanio has said i'm surprised nobody has mentioned harrison's uncle brian Without a father figure in his life and the code, perhaps Harrison has gone down the same road as the ice truck killer, Brian Moser. Harrison's behaviour even reminds me of Brian. He can be a very sociable and seem totally normal, but has a dark side. Remember how easily Brian started a relationship with Deb. History repeating itself. Thanks, Randall. 
That's certainly an interesting point and uh, food for thought. There's been so much positivity about New Blood and any or most negativity has centred around nitpicks. Certainly for me. This email from John Rongarian has me reaching for the old mantra in response. Come on, guys. You remember what that was. <laughs> so John says that uh, episode five is his least liked episode so far. A lot of the revelations are things we already knew or suspected would happen, and he's not convinced this season will have a satisfying ending. He's not liking the Harrison Dexter thing. He writes, I'm still not convinced he has killed anyone or will kill anyone in this season. The biggest thing I'm having an issue with Harrison is that he stated to Dexter that he wanted answers, but has only asked him a single question about the note, and they never talked about it again. And then he gets all whiny when Dexter questions him about the stabbing when it's already been established that he knows his father worked for the cops and would have the ability to suspect something. I'm left totally annoyed at the whole Harrison Dexter thing. John agrees with what Kim and I were saying about Batista, that the events with Trinity killing Rita and then what happened to Dexter and Deb should be indelibly imprinted on his brain. He wouldn't forget any of that. I think his hesitation was just the writer creating a little dramatic tension as we briefly wonder whether he'll say the word Harrison. John considers Molly dead weight at the moment and he's certain she's not come to Iron Lake because of Matt or the missing girls. He's convinced she's there because she knows about Dexter. And to his last point, it's quite plausible that she's sleuth sleuthed. Sleuthed. <laughs> thing to say when you've got teeth. Or not, I don't know. <laughs> I made a hash of it. Sleuthed. There, I said it. She sleuthed something about Dexter and tracked him down. How, though? I don't know. Harrison started on the trail because of the letter, but Dexter won't have written to Molly, so how would she have found him? I'm sorry things haven't been impressing you much, John, <laughs> but it's at this point I think I need to drag the dusty old chest out of the shed. Come on, I've got to do it. The one marked season eight and lift out these words, which I keep stored just for times like this. Are you ready? Trust the show. <laughs> it's been a while since I said it and the first time this season. And let's face it, the mantra didn't work out too well before, but I think it will this time. Clyde Phillips. I think he deserves our trust. And of all the original writers, he picked Scott Reynolds to join in this season We've had this game changer already in only episode five. There's still a lot to come, and I hope it gives us all something great to chew on. Are you Dexter Morgan? It's me, Harrison. Harrison. You can't. Everyone close to you dies. That's why we're here. You're listening to Dissecting Dexter. I don't know who you're talking about. Bruce Evans in Australia has got in touch to say he loved the episode. He writes, Now everything that we expected to happen this season is starting to begin. The walls are closing in on Dexter now. Angela is going to keep digging and it will not end well, that's for sure. The second half of the season is definitely going to be intense. Seeing Batista again actually got me quite emotional. He's one of my favourite characters and it's nice to see him doing well. I really do miss the old Miami Metro crew investigating cases as those scenes have now been replaced by annoying teenager slash high school scenes to show to the show's detriment. One thing we really missed out on in the original series was seeing Batista find out that Dex is a serial killer. Oh, thank you. Hello. Pardon my cat. <laughs> You're listening live. Uh, Bruce goes on to say, I hope Batista appears again and we get to see his reaction. Not only Dex... <laughs> Silly cat. I, I might edit that out. I might forget. <laughs> I hope Batista appears again and we get to see his reaction to not only Dex being alive, but that he was the Bay Harbor Butcher all along. That's if Dex is caught and everything about him is revealed to everyone. If there is a manhunt this season with Dex on the run, I hope Batista, Masuka and Matthews are involved. 
There's going to be a bit of criticism from fans about Dexter being sloppy and reckless, especially why he would go to kill a suspect right after the police said they're going to look into him. He almost got caught and still proceeds to go to the house and do it anyway. But in my opinion, it does make sense that he would act in this reckless manner after 10 years of inactivity. Now, at this point, Bruce says that it reminds him of the BTK killer and how long he evaded capture and went into hiding for nearly a decade. And when he came back out of hiding, he made mistakes that led to his capture. So Bruce says that this might be a common trait for serial killers to be very careless when they resume their activity after a long time in hiding. So it's possible that the writers used this real life example for Dexter's character. So after a decade of inactivity, it makes sense that he would be very rusty and careless and just let the dark passenger control him without thinking about the chances of being caught. Like John just now, Bruce is also disappointed by the Dexter Harrison interactions, or more specifically, what they are not talking about. He says he was hoping to see more deep and meaningful conversations between them, like about Rita and her death, Harrison's childhood, what growing up with Hannah was like, Harrison asking more about why Dexter went into hiding, him being curious about his step-siblings, Aster and Cody, what happened to them. Bruce just feels that the screen time for the conversations between Dexter and Harrison could be more effectively used to build trust and a stronger emotional connection between them instead of arguing all the time. This can then eventually lead to Dex opening up more about who he actually is and the Dark Passenger. Thanks, Bruce. I agree with you that it feels like there is a lot being left unsaid between father and son at the moment. Certain conversation topics are notable by their absence and it would be good to hear them chatting about things like Aster and Cody, what Rita was like, just stuff from those days. It would help them bond and make the connection that they both need. Hello, Captain Batista. Hi, Gareth. Chris here with some thoughts and feedback on episode five, Runaway. Again, I thought this was a solid episode of Dexter. What I really liked about it was um, we seen Dexter in danger of getting caught again, which was really reminiscent of early Dexter. And I think something we, that we universally loved about the original series. It was great seeing Batista again. I did have my suspicions that we would see um, some returning characters this season. And when Angela and Molly were heading to New York and we knew that there was going to be the police conference, I had a suspicion that we might see someone. And I was really quite nicely surprised to see Batista. A little bit of negative feedback with regards to that. I thought it was really silly that he didn't remember Harrison's name. I know only 10 years have passed, but it was such a big part of his life. He was so close to Devin Dexter and even Harrison in a way. I can't believe that he wouldn't have remembered Harrison's name. I thought that was a silly bit of dialogue. And I did say last week that I wasn't going to nitpick, so I'm not going to harp on too much about that. Um, it does look like Angela might be on to cut. Now, not for the reason that we, we all know that she should be on to him, but she is at least um, having her suspicions raised by the fact that he's clearly paid someone to pretend to be Matt in the hotel. Um, Molly's podcast, I believe now, is canon to the show. They released a 10-minute episode uh, via social media, etc. And they did speak about it today. So she knows so much about the the case and the previous case, the Trinity Killer case, the Bay Harbor Butcher case and the Ice Truck Killer case. She name-checks Deborah Morgan um, and Quinn in the episode that I listened to. So I cannot believe that she didn't know who Dexter was. I feel that's really quite um, quite strange as well, but that might come into play later on. Um, Dexter battling with how to deal with Harrison was another interesting part of um, this week's episode for me. You can see he clearly wants to connect with him. Um, and through Deb, Dexter mentions um, that he should maybe tell him about the 100 plastic bags at the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean. Obviously, this is tongue in cheek. Um, and then he calls himself a, a fucking monster um, via Deb. So you can tell that he wants to help Harrison. Um, the way he perhaps wasn't helped by Harry um, in the past. And they do mention that it was child abuse by Harry um, and teaching him the code rather than getting him psychiatric help, which they look to be going down that route with Harrison, um, I think, in the coming episodes. 
I thought it was interesting Dexter wanting to kill the drug dealer. I really got the sense that he wanted to kill him and was using vengeance as an excuse. You could almost see he was he almost looked like an addict just having to do it and wanting to do it. And I did um, like how he nearly got caught twice. I thought that was really interesting. It wasn't just cut and dry that he got his kill. Um, you could definitely see in his eyes that he wanted the hunt and he wanted to kill that drug dealer. Um, it was really um, quick thinking to also overdose the dealer. I thought that was really good. Although um, there was a few timey-wimey issues um, with regards to that. Um, I did mention last week that perhaps we might not trust Logan. I feel that there was a lot of tension building between Dexter and Logan this week. And we saw a new side um, of Logan when he was interrogating the drug dealer in the police station. Um, he also did take it as verbatim that Matt was in New York. Should we trust him or is it just me overthinking? Angela um, finding out who Dexter is was, for me, a welcome surprise in this episode. I, I knew she would at some point, I suspected she would, but I didn't think it would come this early in the season. Um, I did mention before that some of the dialogue um, with Batista was a wee bit on the nose for me, but I'll forgive it. Um, we now know that Kurt is the killer. I'm still not ruling out that there's other people involved. Um, every couple of months, he goes through the routine of playing runaway, dancing, etc. Is this his kill cycle? Um, he did mention that it's not about, it's not what this is about when the young victim took her top off and he got vi visibly angry. Um, is this ruining um, what he's actually getting from this whole act and whole ritual? Interesting to think about. Very similar to Trinity's theatrics. Was Kurt's kill cycle interrupted? And will he have to get a new victim quicker? Certainly it was looking like that could potentially be Harrison, but he doesn't fit the, the mould of the young girl runaway. So I think we're going to see perhaps a, a Harrison and Kurt Emperor Palpatine situation forming over the next couple of episodes. Um, as I said before, it was really it was a good episode again. It was really nice to see um, Batista, and I don't want my nitpicking to get in the way of that. I often think that we grew to love these characters because we spent eight years with them. I liken it to Lost. Lost for me, in the end, wasn't really a show about the mystery or about the island. It was about the characters. I fell in love with these characters um, to the point that when I watched the final season, which is a very divisive season of television. I still get really emotional because of what happens to the characters that I uh, learned to love. I know this isn't a lost podcast, but it's a good sort of comparison to make when we think about seeing Batista again and perhaps maybe some other characters if we see them again as well. Um, just some quick thoughts to um, Gareth. Almost called you Dexter there. Um, I loved the podcast last week with you and Axel and it was really a welcome treat to have it split into two so a double dose of dissecting Dexter is always welcome um, in my eyes um, it was great having your dialogue and back and forth with Axel and it was also really good hearing him comment on the amazing listener feedback I think the listener feedback and emails this um, new season have been excellent and I really enjoy um, listening to them as well um, but I will hopefully speak to you soon and I'll see you in another life, brother. Thanks, Chris. Dexter in Jeopardy. This is a fundamental element of the show that we need. And the Jeopardy has slowly been building and has now gone into overdrive. You've talked about Angela being onto Kurt now, but not for the more serious reasons we know about. But after this week, how we've seen him lose his composure at being denied his ritual kill, Perhaps he'll get all flustered by Angela's inevitable questions. That he'll make a costly mistake. Maybe lash out at her physically. Who knows? You bring up Molly's podcast and all the information from Miami that she knows about. How could she not know the name Dexter Morgan if she did her homework for the podcast? It just occurred to me, listening to you there, bearing in mind how I nitpicked Angela's quick printout of Dexter's, Dexter's obituary earlier. We don't know what sort of conversation Angela and Molly had in the car on their road trip back to Iron Lake, fresh with the information from Batista. They could have put a few things together. And then when Audrey said he's not really called Jim Lindsay, the final penny dropped. Trust the show <laughs> again. See, the mantra works. <laughs> and well done getting a Star Wars reference in there. 
I'm a massive Star Wars fan, and I like the mention of Emperor Palpatine maybe taking on a new apprentice. <laughs> I don't think I can see him teaching Harrison the, the, the ways of the dark side, how to kill runaway girls, but it's a fun comparison. We've not really talked about why Kurt's doing what he's doing, have we, yet? Why this particular MO? On the basis of this week, one with absolutely no sexual element. What is it that he's trying to reenact? Does this ritual have tragedy in its origin? Tragedy that Kurt may be experienced at a young age? I'd like it if it was something that prompted some degree of audience sympathy rather than just an out-and-out evildoer. This ritual, it, it just seems too specific and tailored to not be replicating something that happened in Kurt's life. And thanks for bringing up Lost 2. <laughs> I'm right there with you on that. And your comment about the feedback this season. As you all know, and I say it often, I love hearing from you guys and finding out what you think. It can help develop my own ideas too, like just then, thinking about the origin of Kurt's ritual. And this week is certainly a bumper crop. Thanks again, Chris. An email now from Chris. A different Chris. He says, If it's possible... I had two exact opposite thoughts at almost the same time in this episode. First, it was, all right, it's Batista. And as I immediately realised what it could mean for Dexter, it became, oh no, it's Batista. It was just too good to see that character again. I'm re-watching season one as I'm watching New Blood and Batista never fails to bring a smile to my face. I was just kind of hoping that his sister Jamie would have been mentioned. But that could be because I'm a big fan of Amy Garcia's work on Lucifer too. I loved Logan, questioning drug dealer. Even before Dexter's monologue said that even he was intimidated, I was thinking that Logan is resembling the second coming of Dokes, who I would like to see the return to haunt Dexter like Deb at some point. I loved Dexter's improvisation on killing the dealer via forced overdose. Still hate, hate, hate Molly Park, and I was reminded of this again when they played her podcast on previously on. The Valley Girl delivery is just too much. And knowing it's not a real podcast, I have to say that I've never heard a podcast where the host seems to be gleefully retelling the killer's deeds. And I'm so glad I haven't. Molly's podcast gave me the vibe of her saying, look at what Trinity did. Isn't that cool? Between that and her utterly over the top self-absorbed behavior, I'm hoping against hope that she's intended strictly as a parody of a podcaster. One last thing. Due to this season, Runaway has joined the piano solo from Layla, as seen in Goodfellas, as pieces of music that give me the creeps. Thanks, Chris. I was out and about yesterday for work, and all bloody day I had Runaway in my head, whistling it, humming it, bloody singing it. I'm a sucker for an earworm, though. It doesn't take much to put one in my head. <laughs> and no, that isn't an open invitation for people to try and get me through their voicemails next week, all right? <laughs> Matt from Dublin has emailed. I'm asking for trouble now, aren't I? <laughs> Matt from Dublin has emailed. He thought this was a strong episode and is on board with the theory that Kurt knows about Dexter's involvement in Matt's disappearance and thinks he's getting close to Harrison as part of his plan for revenge. Matt suggests that Dexter's underestimated the smarts of the Iron Lake police and won't realise it until it's too late. He also thinks that Angela, now she's discovered who Dexter is, could give Batista a ring and let him know he's in Iron Lake. Thanks, Matt. Yes, she could. I honestly think she'll not jump to any quick reactions, though. She apparently loves Dexter, so I think she'll give him a chance to explain first. Ryan Gillen has emailed... He's one of my new Patreons, so thanks, Ryan. Long-term listener too, which is nice. He's loving new blood so far. He likes how Dexter reacted differently to Kurt when the ritual was messed up and notes how it's only the second person on the table in five episodes. He does say, though, and I quote, My beef with this segment is why they felt a need to have both a drug dealer and that dealer's supplier for Dexter to track down, which ate up too much less interesting screen time. I feel like they could have stuck with the one dealer and have the encounter play out like a combination of the two, meeting him in the bar, then following following him to the drug den. As it was, I wasn't even very interested in the usual kill room chat because we literally know nothing about the guy other than he made the drugs that Harrison OD'd on. 
I know it's showing that Dexter is really becoming loosey-goosey with the code and that it's purely revenge, as Deb points out, but it's still not a good sign when I want to fast-forward the part that I usually love most, Dexter on the hunt. He didn't even need to do any real sleuthing. As for both drug dudes, he just gets their names and locations from Logan's loose lips and a sticky note. Indeed, Ryan, uh, Kim and I talked about this and agree with you. It was a little convenient how Dexter got his intel this week, but we must remember that the kill this week was not driven by his need to kill. It was purely revenge, an emotional kill, as the writer put it on the wrap-up podcast. So you could argue that he wasn't bound by the code in the same way. However, he sure had to act fast when he saw Logan outside and did a good job of plan B. Ryan continues by saying how he's how he's finding Harrison so uh, or becoming more unlikable. He says he's clearly liking the positive attention and adulation he's getting as a hero, but he shuts down whenever Dexter tries to communicate with him about what's really going on. He said, uh, Ryan says, I really wanted Dexter to be more forceful in confronting Harrison with the straight razor, and how Harrison's story of events is bullshit. But he keeps hesitating and backing off, letting Harrison get away with his teenage angsty, you don't trust me, Dad, how can I trust you? <laughs> and I hope this comes to a head soon and the truth comes out for both of them. Me too, Ryan. Thanks for your email. Also in the email bag, this one from a first-time feedbacker, Karen King. She says some lovely things about the podcast, which I really appreciate. Before talking about Deb, she says, I think the dark, sombre depiction of Deb is accurate. She's in Dexter's mind and it's reasonable that his overwhelming guilt would play out with Deb as a morose, angry figure. He has been carrying the burden of ruining everyone's life for the last 10 years and his inner dialogue feels right. Much like he had Harry as his moral compass, he's using Deb to keep him in check. Although after last night's episode we see how Dex is no longer beating himself up anymore. He's giving in to what he feels is his true self. Thanks Karen, I agree with you. It makes sense for Dexter's mind to manifest this version of Deb. Overall, I loved, I've, I have loved the erratic appearances of Deb. Some manic, some affectionate or melancholy, some just being sensible. <laughs> it's a great window into his mind beyond the voiceovers, which of course are purely subjective. The interactions with Deb give us a much more reliable view into his head. Phil Dunn has emailed him with a point that he suggests might only be appreciated by a Dexter nerd, but says it could indicate a brilliant clue or a sloppy mistake. He says his son pointed out that in episode three, when Harrison is meeting the science teacher, he says in Spanish, and of course I'm going to butcher this, <laughs> he says, de donde eres, or where are you from? In Argentina, where Harrison was raised, they would say, de donde sos and not de Donda Eris. Is this perhaps some evidence that he's an imposter because someone who was raised in Argentina would use Argentinian Spanish? Like I said, it's a very fine point, but if Harrison turns out to not be who he claims to be, it's a great clue. Thanks, Phil. This is fascinating. <laughs> I don't speak any Spanish beyond ordering a beer or asking for the bill. <laughs> as evidenced by uh, probably how badly I pronounced that Spanish in your email. But this is a great catch by your son. Well done. I can't comment on the language used. Maybe if we have a native Spanish speaker listening, they could comment. But you would think they would check the dialect, wouldn't you? Knowing that there would be many Spanish speakers among the audience who might spot a, um, a regional inaccuracy like that. If we're keeping the mantra of trust the show, let's keep the fun and say this could be a nice clue. But it would be interesting to know if that uh, if that catch is a mistake or intended. That would be a lovely Easter egg, wouldn't it? From Israel, Shai has emailed back. And I'm glad, Shai, that you've forgiven me for the bad reading of your email a couple of weeks ago when Axel was on. Uh, Shai says, this episode left me with mixed emotions. It was good, and the plot went forward significantly, but had convenient writing at times. Like that girl going so happily with a stranger to his cabin in the woods without suspicion, or Dexter going to kill the drug dealers. Yes, 
he's angry, but why risking everything by going after them when the police can do the job? That went without good explanation. Shy goes on to list some observations from the episode, among which is agreement with me that he's not certain Harrison has the dark passenger. He also says he liked the use of podcast the week before, but that the 11-minute version they uploaded to the wrap-up podcast feed was bad. He says it was scripted badly and overused the F-word. No way would this be a top podcast in any category. Thanks, Shy. And speaking of Molly's podcast... Hey, 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 and welcome to the Dissecting Fucking Dexter podcast. I'm your host, Garrett Napkins, and boy, do I have a doozy of a fucking episode for you. On this fucking episode, we're talking about the latest fucking episode of New Blood, Runaway. More specifically, Harrison. I mean, like, what's his deal? Why is he all the time acting like a moody brat? Is there something he's upset about that the writers forgot to tell us? Let's fucking dive in. Okay. Can we talk about what a weird fucko Harrison was this whole fucking episode? I mean, like, OMG, he goes to that party and he cuts that fucking girl's foot with a fucking knife. You know knives. Those sharp, sometimes serrated pieces of metal used as weapons, tools, and eating utensils since prehistoric times? I had a girlfriend once who used a knife to cover our initials into a sacred tree on Indian burial ground, and now we're both haunted by ghouls and spookies. But that's besides the point. Harrison took a fucking knife and sliced right into that girl's dorsalis pedis artery. She would realistically need some fucking medical attention right after that. Now, I don't know all this because I'm a foot weirdo. We just already did an episode on Tarantino. Check your feed for that. But yas, what a fucking warrior queen Audrey was this episode. MVP for sure. That fierce bitch fucking handled her business and acted like the total girl boss she was when Harrison was struggling with the drugs he was on. She kept her cool and knew exactly who to call when Harrison was freaking out and started babbling about his dad. Like, breaking news alert, Harrison, that's a total fucking dick move. Don't go telling your dad's business to every girl you've got a crush on. As I always say on the Dissecting Fucking Dexter podcast, Dex before sex, am I right, gang? She already likes you, bro. Stop saying weird shit that's just gonna turn her off. Before we leave, we've got to do the Dissecting Fucking Dexter top three dumb character moments brought to you by Fred's Fish and Game. Fred's Fish and Game, because gay people can be Republicans, too. The number three dumb character moment was when the green-haired girl charged directly at Kurt when she could have ran around the side of the house. This was maybe one of the most misogynistic things the writers have ever pulled. Are we really supposed to believe that she was dumb enough to try to take Lurch on in a fight? If a woman wrote this episode, she would have figured out something smarter to do in that situation. A real woman would have known that she lacked the physical coordination to accomplish such a difficult task. I mean, haven't the writers ever seen the way women drive? The number two dumb character moment was when Dexter was trying to kill New York Jesse Pinkman when he knew the police were coming to arrest him. Dex, darling, did you think you could be so fucking reckless and go anywhere you want and do anything you fucking please with no consequences? Oh, oh wait, you did? Oh wait, then never mind. Bitch, are you for real? And the number one most dumb character moment of this fucking episode is, wait for it, Harrison throwing away his dad's breakfast for no reason. H-Dog, we know you're upset, but you didn't have to be so extra and throw away the ceramic and silverware to boot. You're acting really sus right now, bro. No cap. So that's it for another fucking episode of the Dissecting Fucking Dexter podcast. If you like what you fucking heard, you can follow me and the show on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, Snapchat, LinkedIn, Hot or Not, Dog Pound, Popcorn, Chud, and MySpace. Stay tuned for next week's episode where we take a deep dive into the returning fan-favorite character of Captain Angel Batista. Has he sadly been relegated to just being exposition dump pervert man? Spoiler alert, the answer is yes. <laughs> Words fail me. You know, after Miami... You never get used to this damn cold. I thought you didn't know me. You were right. You're listening to Dissecting Dexter. I'm Dexter Morgan. Your father. Oh, shit, he's caught! Hey, guys, Des here. Can I say shit? Because I just said it twice. But um, I will cease from now on. You know, just to keep this family-friendly. Sorry, children who are watching Dexter potentially murder people. 
Where was I? Dexter is caught. Oh my God. Okay, guys. Batista is back. Okay, I know everyone was speculating that it wasn't going to be Batista, that we would see other people, but I'm really excited because he had moved up in ranks. He's got connections. He's the one who just dropped Harrison's name. Holy crap. A lot of people have predicted this, and I mean, kudos to them. A round of applause to everyone who said Angela was going to be the one to find out. Y'all called it, and I'm so excited for next week. Oh, man. Also, Harrison and our freaking new serial killer daddy. This poor kid. His real father's a serial killer. He was abandoned to the serial killer's girlfriend, who was a serial poisoner. Now he's in town and being offered a job by the local serial killer. I mean, born in blood is one thing, but he is on a path. Oh man, I'm enjoying this episode. I'm so excited. I'm happy to be sharing with you guys and I'm gonna just leave it off on that note. Talk to you guys soon. Bye! Des out! Thanks Des. After Travis just now, I don't think you need to worry about keeping this family appropriate. <laughs> so a shit or two is okay. So yes, Harrison, born in blood and now apparently swimming in it. Poor kid. <laughs> if he doesn't have a dark passenger, I would still be amazed if he didn't carry some mental health issues. Glad you're excited for where we're going with all this though. I am too. I've had an email from another new feedbacker, Sarah in New York, who's up to date with New Blood, but doing a rewatch with her husband and they're up to season four. She says, aside from the obvious Harrison straight razor connections, this season's big bad in Kirk Caldwell has some similarities to Trinity himself. In season one, episode one, when we see Trinity's first on-screen kill of the girl in the bathtub, he whispers to her, it's already over, as he slashes her leg. A striking similarity to the you're already dead scrawled around the camera in Kurt's dungeon, so to speak. I think there's also something to be said about Kurt's freak out when Chloe doesn't follow his preconceived plan, similar to how rit ritualistic Trinity always had to be as well. Thanks, Sarah. Yes. There are indeed a lot of callbacks this season to the original series, some of them very obscure, not just the character names, but things like this that may or may not be intentional. I also loved Kurt's freak out when Chloe didn't do what he'd hoped. He was like a frustrated toddler, just stopping short of stamping his foot and throwing Teddy out of the pram. <laughs> Hey Gareth, this is Mike and I'm sending in my feedback for Runaway, the fifth episode of Dexter New Blood. So this episode for me is definitely a step down from last week. Um, if last week was, I think, the, the best of the season has had to offer so far, this one is, um, you know, basically down where episode two and three is for me. Um, there's some good stuff here, but there's definitely some less than stellar writing. Um, Harrison still is the strongest part of this entire season for me so far. Uh, he and Dexter attempting to connect and not really working out too well. He gets into a fight with Dexter, goes off to this party and gets drunk, takes some drugs. And next thing you know, he's telling Audrey that Jim is not his real name. Um, this has always been the big risk with Harrison because Harrison from the start knew that Jim was not Jim, knew that he was Dexter Morgan. And when you have a son who, he may be your son, but you don't have a strong connection to, you haven't seen him in, in many, many years. There's all this build up resentment. All it takes is one slip of the tongue. And that's exactly what happened. Uh, but everything else worked well for me regarding his storyline, the resentment, the anger, all of it. Um, go to uh, Kurt Caldwell, and I'm definitely a lot less scared of his character now after this episode. It just didn't really work for me. I mean, we got confirmation that he's the sniper, and I thought maybe there might be some last-second misdirection there on that. But, you know, I, yeah, he's the sniper, uh, obviously. No, but I just, I don't know. I didn't, I was a lot less terrified of him after this episode because of the way things went down. It just, not as chilling of a 
killer as I thought he was going to be. Uh, which takes us to Dexter uh, being sloppy, going, trying, you know, killing or trying to kill two separate drug dealers, one a drug dealer, one a drug supplier, I guess. But in broad daylight, I mean, anybody could have pulled up to that bar at any moment. It didn't have to be the cops and it would have looked terrible. And then he goes to kill Jasper and, you know, you have no idea who is in that house, really. Uh, you don't have a picture of Jasper. You don't know what he looks like. It, it could have been an associate of his. It could have been a friend. It could have been a relative. It could have been anybody in that house. He got lucky. It, in fact, was Jasper, the right person. But that's just luck. That I mean, that's this isn't the code. This is just, like Deb said, vengeance. But he wasn't even sure if he was going to be hurting the right person in this regard. So it just was very, very sloppy to me. I mean, Matt Caldwell, his whole thing was was the epitome of careful as opposed to what this was, which was just complete and utter recklessness, even if I understand, you know, wanting to protect his, his son. So that leads me into the worst part of the episode, the clunkiest part by far, which was Molly and Angela off to New York, they, you know, they go to find Matt with the credit cards and they end up finding somebody else using them. And they, they happen to go to the police conferences there. And who is the keynote speaker? Angel Batista, of course. And, you know, Angela strikes up a conversation and lo and behold, Batista gives all this, all this information about uh, Trinity and the behavior butcher, Deb, Dexter, Harrison, all this stuff and it's just so clunky writing it 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 it's terrible it really is it it really it makes me wince <laughs> really i was watching it and the whole time i was thinking this is how they're doing it you know this 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 massive just contrivance that they go there and batista the one person that would be able to provide this information just happens to be there you know instead of using molly and all her resources and the people that she knows, her online community and, you know, her knowledge of, of the Bay Harbor Butcher case and Trinity. And, you know, they could have had her go through, like, they could have had her recognize Dexter finally or maybe thought she did. Like, I know him. Finally, it, like, I, I need to figure out where I know this guy. And so she goes through all of her stuff. She's searching, not sure where she's seen him. And then just maybe a random picture of Dexter and Rita pop up on her computer and there he is. This isn't Jim Lindsay, this is Dexter Morgan, she tells um, Angela, who then does her own search and finds out that Dexter worked for what? Miami Metro? Whoa, 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 what's going on here? And you know, she maybe she makes a call down to Batista and that gets the ball rolling for the back end of the season. Maybe Batista, Quinn, and Mizuka are coming north to take out a friend. Maybe they finally realize that, uh, you know, Dexter's the Bay Harbor Butcher. Maybe, oh, maybe, maybe Batista went through that box of LaGuardia's stuff like he should have back in season eight. You know, it it's just, even if all that is set aside, even if that is not part of the end game, I feel like they could have done so much better in the way that they got this information across to Angela. Because that's obviously the important thing here that Angela has doubts and begins to question Jim and his story. And, you know, that's, that's kind of the whole thing there, at least at this point. So I don't know, they could have done so much better. I just hated that. I liked the fact that we're pulling in Miami Metro in some fashion. I just don't like how they did it. So anyway, all right, Gareth, that's it for me. Uh, thanks for uh, taking my feedback and I'll be talking to you next week. Thanks, Mike. Excellent analysis of the episode there. I'm with you on the Dexter Harrison thing. The overarching story of their relationship is the most compelling element of the season for me. The Clyde Phillips and Scott Reynolds comments um, pre-season and on the wrap-up podcast, they've emphasised 
that New Blood is all about fathers and sons. So it lines up that this should be the most interesting storyline. It's been well acted and they've had some good scenes, but I still feel like we're missing out on some key conversation topics. You're right with your comments on Dexter going after Miles and Jasper. Very good point that Dexter went in blind into that house. Think of the kills of yesteryear. He did his homework back then, didn't he? Anyone could indeed have been in that house and no, I don't think he did know what Jasper looked like. He and the writers acknowledge that this was driven by revenge and emotion, but as human beings, we all know how badly things can go when we react emotionally. Rationality can go in the rubbish bin. Our brains have a logic part and an emotional part, and when the emotional part takes charge, rather than working in tandem, things can go wrong. We know that time was short for Dexter, but I would say that he definitely reacted completely emotionally and made a conscious choice not to be diligent. And it was nearly his undoing. I I hate to say it, but you also make fair points about Batista's expo- exposition dump. The way that Angela fla- found out could have been done a lot more subtly. They'd introduced Molly and made a point of the resources that she has. She could have made a connection, and then they could have made a call to Batista. I still wonder if maybe the two had a conversation in the car that we didn't see, but I think that would have been interesting to see. Clunky might be a reasonable word for you to use. Overall, though, I think I like having Angela find out in episode five, because it makes me wonder what the last five will bring us. We did speculate pre-season that the series could be split in half in a significant way, and perhaps it will. But there is a reasonable argument to be had that this week's revelation could have been portrayed more smoothly. Here's Nick Henderson. Hey Gareth, Nick here. Uh, Time to talk about episode 5, Runaway. Uh, This is a big episode with a lot to digest. Um, It's a little bit everything that fans love about the show, plus some of that, uh, that, that new blood, if you will. Uh, it's so packed, actually, that it's pr- it was pretty hard for me to pick a highlight, uh, one specific highlight anyways. Uh, you know, we've got some great Dexter and Deb scenes. we got Dexter on the hunt, Dexter thinking on his feet. And of course, we got that non-traditional kill that happens at the end, which is quite honestly, maybe one of the most fucked up kills I've ever seen him commit on the show. Um, but after a lot of thought, I think I'm going to go with the kill list party. I think the scene played really well. And in a lot of ways, it seems like it might be the turning point for the show which is fitting considering this is the halfway point. Um, I mean, overall, I've been pretty impressed by the acting from all the, the, the high schooler characters in the show so far. Um, and seeing Harrison walk into that party and just get this just huge, boisterous greeting from uh, his peers, which is actually the greeting he wanted to get from his dad, was, you know, it was heartbreaking. I, I, I felt it. Um, so that was great. But you know, as the party continues, he takes the drugs and we see the camera shift that to that <laughs> cool, like, head tracking angle, which I really loved. Uh, the whole euphoric effect with the music and his interaction with the girls in the kitchen was just perfect. Uh, not to mention, the whole scene was just beautifully shot. I mean, honestly, everything in this season seems to be just really gorgeous to look at, but this scene definitely feels like a standout to me. Um, and then, of course, at the very end of the, of the party scene, we got Harrison's confession to Audrey. Uh, which to me just felt very natural and believable. And, um, w- you know, like most of Jack Alcott's performance so far, it was just, it, it, I felt it. Um, and it's obvious how that piece of information is going to be a big problem for Dexter. Um, on another note, I do think it was great to see Angel back, uh, even if it was fleeting. I do really hope he turns up again at the very end of the show, uh, especially if we end up getting that Dexter is caught storyline that a lot of us have been yearning for. Uh, it'd be really cr- great to see the two of them fa- face to face with everything out in the out in the open. Um, but anyways, uh, in an episode full of standout moments, uh, the party was a huge one for me, so I wanted to make sure I got some attention. But as always, I can't wait to hear from you and from all the other listeners. So until next week, cheers. Thanks very much, Nick. Yes, I think the party sequence was really well done. Everything about it looked and sounded good. Tremendous production values, and of course. It set up a turning point for the series. Whether Angel will be back again, I don't know, but in my head, I'm visualising his face, aghast, looking at his old friend again, but this time with the knowledge of who Dexter really is. 
I have a harder time, on the other hand, imagining Dexter's expression, looking back. Would it be blank? Or would there be regret and sadness? Could be heartbreaking. Just going back to Travis's feedback, no prizes for guessing which one that was. That was brilliant, mate. Thanks for putting so much effort into that. You got Molly's shtick just right. Garrett <laughs> napkins. That still makes me snigger. <laughs> that made my eyes water the first time I heard it. Travis did emphasise, and I'm sure you'll have all realised this, so maybe it goes without saying, but Travis did emphasise off air that the views expressed by Garrett Napkins do not necessarily reflect those of Travis Shefflin and are all definitely delivered in character. <laughs> Great stuff. Great, thank you. If you want to uh, get in touch with me, you can. Pardon my laptop. If you want to get in touch with me, you can. Dissectingdexter at gmail.com, where, of course, you are also welcome to submit a voicemail to get your, your own dulcet tones on the podcast. You could also uh, drop me a line on Facebook, facebook.com slash dissectingdexter, or Twitter, where it's at dissectdexter. I did have a little dialogue uh, this week. Someone pointed out, someone pointed out that um, Batista was wearing his wedding ring this week, and... It set me wondering whether this was accidental. Maybe David Zayas innocently forgot to take it off on set or whether actually it was intended and Batista is still married. I sent a message to Scott Reynolds on Twitter who uh, replied back that the prop master, the prop guy, doesn't allow anything to appear on camera that isn't planned for by the writers I think that's the way he put it. In other words, yes, Batista was meant to be wearing a wedding ring. Now, where that wedding ring came from, we can only speculate. But to begin with, I thought naughty Batista, and obviously I criticised him in the in my review, didn't I? That uh, he was flirting with with Angela there and and may still be married. Uh, no, I didn't. I said he was flirting with Angela and a bit quick to uh, adopt that kind of tone. Um, but I hadn't noticed the wedding ring until it was pointed out on Twitter. Sorry, I'm getting jumbled up in my thoughts here. But the point is, uh, yes, he was meant to be wearing a wedding ring. Whether it is the wedding ring that he's never taken off uh, from when we last met him, um, and it was um, the one given to him by LaGuerta, or whether he's since remarried, and he is married and he is being naughty, <laughs> Maybe we'll see him again, and this will be this will be cleared up. But perhaps that was a nice Easter egg that he's he's held on to um, his his last wife, who of course is no longer with us. But that was that was an interesting uh, little tidbit there, uh, and it, and it provoked a bit of uh, back and forth between a few of us on on Twitter, which was nice. And that's nearly it for this week. My thanks again to to Kim for joining me. I forgot to ask her during the recording, but she does have a podcast of her own that I have offered to plug. She says it might not be everyone's cup of tea, but it's called Lesbitarian and it's on the MLGA podcast network at mlganetwork.com. Kim describes the show as being for the ones that the system has never worked for, for the ones who ask questions and don't take their cues from the status quo, and for the ones who know that the most important colours of the rainbow are yellow and black. This is a show that tears apart the political binary and replaces it with reason and non-aggression. If you want to check it out, I'm sure Kim will be delighted by your interest. It's called Lesbitarian and it's at mlganetwork.com and lesbitarian.com. OK, I've got one more bit of feedback. It's from Luke Farmer, who probably at this point was thinking that I'd forgotten him. <laughs> I hadn't, and I haven't called you Chris either. <laughs> as I've done before um, yeah, Luke Farmer in Essex, England who went to a concert last week and saw Princess Goes to the Butterfly Museum at a show in London most of you will know that this is Michael C. Hall's band and Luke has a story to tell about it and how he got to meet the man himself it's great to hear about his experience and I urge you to keep listening after I'm done it's combined with his thoughts on this week's episode but runs for about 10 minutes so I'm sure Luke will I'm sure he will. I hope he will. <laughs> Forgive me for putting it at the end. 
I just wanted to make sure that his full voicemail was out there because I'm sure many of you will be genuinely interested in hearing about his experience too. So thanks again to Luke for sharing and thanks to all of you for listening. We'll be back next week to dissect some more Dexter. Until then, here's Luke. Hi Gareth, hope you're well mate. Uh, as promised, just a quick voice note about the uh, Princess Goes to the Butterfly Museum gig that I went to last week. Uh, so the gig was at Bush Hall in London, which is a pretty small venue, to be honest. Um, you know, if it was packed out, you'd probably have a couple of hundred people in there. But uh, I don't think there was, you know, I don't think there was actually even that many people there, which is surprising because obviously, A, Dexter's in London. And I thought there might be a lot of people going just to be in the same room as uh, Michael C. Hall, which, to be honest, is, is the main reason. Uh, reason I went but also the band are you know genuinely quite good I think I mentioned to you before it's not necessarily my uh, my type of music but they are you know they are, are really good and and Michael Seahill unsurprisingly he's got a great voice and you know he fits the uh, fits the bill as a, as a front man well so uh, yeah strange that there weren't more more people there really but it was a good night and, and I got there sort of 20 minutes before doors opened so I was lucky that uh, I had a really good spot. I mean, to be honest, for the whole gig, I was probably, you know, two foot, three foot uh, away from him. So it's, it's a pretty intimate, you know, intimate venue, like I was saying. And uh, yeah, it was, it was great to be up, up front of the stage and, and seeing performing sort of live right in front of you. It's strange, really, when you've watched, you know, watch somebody on, on TV for, for so long. I and mean, I've watched seasons one to eight, probably two three times so that's a couple of hundred hours you know staring at him on the tv and then when he's right in front of you it's uh you know quite a quite a surreal thing really but yeah the gig was uh gig was good very very loud strange music really uh it's sort of like david bowie meets acdc but i do i do uh i do like it and i like it more than i than i did after the gig it was uh you know it was enjoyable watching them play um so yeah the obviously the, the gig ended most people left and you know I thought I might try and stick around and just see if I could catch him coming out of a side door or uh, see if I could you know catch him to, to sign my shirt or something like that but everybody I checked with seemed to uh, seemed to tell me that he'd gone but everyone gave me a different story one person said oh he's off because he's got to go and do a show on channel four somebody else said that he was having a having a bit of a dispute or discussion with with his manager and that they they both left quite quickly and you know different stories and different people so i didn't i didn't buy it uh, and i'm pleased i didn't because i stuck around probably for 40 minutes after the uh after the gig had ended I was waiting by a side door and obviously there was some some other people that had the same idea um and eventually it, it did take a while but he he come out and he he, he come over and did a bit of a, a a meet and greet and said hello to the fans who were who were waiting for him i was pretty much the first person he come over to, to uh, i think from memory um he just just come over and said you know hi how you doing and i've sort of as i mentioned earlier it was probably a bit starstruck really when you've seen someone on tv for uh you know for so long as i said when they're right in front of you and then talking to you it was i didn't really know what to say but i uh i don't know probably said something like yeah you know great the gig was crick was gig was great how we were uh, how are you um asked him to sign my shirt i had a american apparel green dexter shirt on and you know he, he commented saying it's the uh, original article and they don't make them anymore so that was that was pretty cool um for him to sign my shirt and he then sort of went round signing a few uh you know a few other bits and pieces for people having photos done and then inevitably you got the uh the ebay sellers come running over you know there's about three or four people coming over asking him to sign loads of stuff not fans that hadn't been to the gig just purely trying to obviously uh you know make some money off of his name which was which was pretty annoying they sort of started surrounding him a bit and then his security guard slash stage manager slash roadie i don't know i don't know what he was a big bloke started sort of throwing his weight around a bit and and pretty much called an end to it um you know sort of ushered michael c hall over to the van uh you know the band's van and, and sort of bundled him into the into the back of it really and told everyone that you know that was it and and to, to leave it and i was trying to say to him like oh mate all I, all I wanted was just a just a photo as well like i've been to the gig like please and he was sort of saying no nah, that's it we're done they've uh they've taken the piss you know talk about those uh 
and the guys had come come running over, and I was I was pretty uh, pretty gutted that I didn't manage to get a picture with him. Um, everyone else sort of left and walked off, and I was literally just standing there putting it in my map, still to get back to the station and, and, and whatever else. Um, and then the van started driving off, come to a stop, door opened, Michael C. Hall's hanging out the side of it, and I can't remember exactly what he said. It was it was something like, "Yo, bro, come here, come here." And, uh, and called me over. So I went went running over and he was like, let's get that picture. Um, so I had my picture done with him. Annoyingly, annoyingly it blurred. Um, but, it, you know, it was probably because I'd, I'd got run over. I don't even know if the van had completely stopped moving it or, you know, or, or, or why. But uh, it shows you what a nice nice guy he is. Obviously they say you shouldn't, shouldn't meet heroes and that, but he was uh, he was nothing but you know, a real, uh, real gent, to be honest. Really nice bloke. Um, and I managed in the, sort of the 20 seconds that he uh, the, the door was open just to tell him you know, how much I was enjoying New Blood, how happy it made me and uh, what a legend I thought he was, you know, probably openly fangirled a bit, but what are you going to do? Um, and he, he just sort of laughed and, and, and smiled and, you know, I, I said, you know, great show tonight and, and all the best and, and that was it. But yeah, amazing, uh, amazing night feel really lucky to have to have met him to be honest there's not many people that uh you know that pro probably had the chance so yeah great uh a great moment so i'll uh i'll wrap up just doing some some feedback from the episode um you know episode five i don't want to go on too long i don't i would imagine a lot of people will be skipping through this and uh you know just trying to get back to the podcast so a couple of quick thoughts on on the episode um First of all, another another strong one, another brilliant episode. Really enjoyed it. It did seem like this one was a bit more about uh, Harrison than Dexter, at least in the in the early bit, which you know, which is fine. It's the story they're telling, and it, and it all uh, all links into the you know into the wider plot. Obviously, we now know Kurt's the shooter. Um, I'm wondering why he chooses young girls and uh, you know young single girls and runaways. Perhaps he was abandoned by his mom and then raised in an abusive environment or something like that. And this is his way of you know trying to uh, trying to get back at her. I think I said before that he reminds me a lot of Trinity, and I thought it again this uh, this episode when he sort of reacted to shooting uh, Chloe through you know through the head. He, he sort of reacted in a really tormented way, and it reminded me a bit of that. Uh, Trinity shower screen from uh, you know, from from season four. I'm sure he's obviously upset because, it, as a few people have said, the, the general idea is that he's he's preserving these these bodies. Is he making sort of sick China dolls? Obviously, we we saw before how meticulous he was with washing the bodies and and preserving them and, and cleaning them and that. Um, so I think obviously shooting him through the uh, shooting her through the head sort of ruins that a little bit. I thought it was interesting he then shot her a second time, uh, almost like he shot her where he meant to or where he wanted to the first and he was he was trying to right the wrong. Um, but yeah, interesting, interesting developments. That sort of leads me on to thinking a bit about the, the, the fake Matt Caldwell in the lobby. And I'm wondering if um, he's a buyer or, or part of this network, you know, network of, of rich guys or you know, powerful men with a with a sick hobby and and he's you know sort of helping out um kurt and, and pretending to be matt just to just to try and get the police off of his off of his back um great to have angel back liked how they did it as well thought it was thought it was relatively um you know seamless it seemed completely feasible that he would be a guest speaker at, at one of these events so yeah great to have him back obviously not a massive surprise we knew somebody was coming back and it was either either him or masuka um the only thing i did think was that he seemed a bit a bit blasé about the whole, you know, Deb having died, Dexter dying. Um, obviously, he's not going to open up to a complete stranger in Angela and be, you know, really emotional about it. And he's a he's a captain now. He's, you know, he's he's seen a lot of uh, difficult things in his life. But yeah, I just thought it was very sort of casual and blasé. How he mentioned it, and obviously he barely remembered Harrison's name, which I thought was strange, seeing as his sister uh, basically raised Harrison for two seasons or, or whatever it was. But and I won't read, uh, won't read too much into that. Um, yeah, love the bits where Dexter had to think on his feet. Sort of takes you back to some of the older seasons, and it's nice to know that you know he can still uh, can still think quickly and act, uh, act, you know, when he needs to. Um, yeah, last couple of bits. I know I've I've, I've gone on for a while now. 
now Angela knows, obviously, that Dexter Morgan is, is Jim Lindsay, or rather Jim Lindsay is uh, Dexter Morgan. I'm wondering what she's, you know, what she's going to do about it. I've got a feeling she's going to keep quiet to, to Audrey, to Harrison, to Dexter, to everyone in Iron Lake, really. Um, and she's going to go back to Angel and, you know, that's how Angel's going to come into this more because I can't imagine that he's only um, you know, only going to be doing a cameo. Uh, last bit, music at the end. Don't know if anybody else would have would have noticed it. Um, that is Princess Goes to the Butterfly Museum. So that is Michael C. Hall's band who I went to see. Um, and obviously, I was talking about earlier. I, I wasn't sold on the idea, to be honest. It almost felt a bit like free, free advertisement for the band and they were just plugging it you know, for the sake of it. But then the song that they played is actually called Ketamine. So I guess it's relevant to the episode with Harrison. And I, I didn't mind it. I just, I, I weren't sold. But uh, anyway, there you go. Sorry if I've gone on too long. All the best, mate. I'll speak to you soon.